Our guest today is the CEO of QR Computing, Alex Kiesling. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks, Constantinos. I'm very, very happy to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, so basically, let's start out uh, with an easy one. <laughs> uh, tell us how you found your way to uh, quantum computing and to creating Quera. Sure. Uh, maybe let me start with telling you what Quera is. We're a leading provider of quantum computing uh, hardware, software, and application development. And we are based in Boston. So that's actually part of the story. Uh, I... I grew up in Mexico and when I was in high school, I, it was the first time that I heard about the concepts behind quantum computing. And, you know, it sounded very sci-fi, very uh, intriguing. And I decided that, you know, this was something that I had to get involved with. So I, I applied for, for undergrads uh, all over the place and I ended up coming to the Boston area to do my undergrad at, at MIT in physics. And once I was there, I, I was on a mission to find quantum computers and start using them. And little did I know that back then that was not something that one could do. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so two I, qubits in a lab, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that was about state of the art. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. so I, I started getting involved in, in research and particularly learning about these beautiful experiments that were happening uh, using neutral atoms, what we call neutral atoms, uh, to do all sorts of fun and exciting things. And after that, I, I spent a little bit of time in, in Germany doing more research, uh, again, in understanding how to better use these complex setups that, that were being built around the world to study quantum matter and use it as what we call quantum simulators to solve problems in quantum mechanics using a, uh, a controlled uh, quantum system. Uh, when, I, when I started my graduate studies at Harvard, and this was with uh, Professor Misha, uh, Misha Lukin, and we got involved uh, with also Marcus Greiner, another professor at Harvard, and, and Vladimir Vuletic from MIT, and we started on an entirely new project that progressed very quickly. We were able to go from an empty lab in 2015 to uh, controlling 51 uh, neutral atom qubits by 2017. And the progress just kept coming and decided that the right thing was to take this outside of the lab and, and put it into people's hands and continue supporting the development of the technology and matching it to applications. And that's how Quera was born. Since then, you know, there's been a lot of progress on, on going through this, this uh, commercialization effort and we recently put our first device Aquila on the cloud. So it's been, it's been a, a journey and a very exciting one. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Aquila is uh, pretty impressive. Um, but before we talk about it, uh, I just wanted to give our listeners a little background on what neutral atom quantum computing is, how it differs from other types that they might be more familiar with? Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the, the biggest difference is what are we using as our qubits? There are other companies and research groups that are attempting all sorts of different approaches to how to build a quantum computer. Uh, for us, we decided that the, the technology that we're most comfortable with and that we have the the strongest belief in its ability to continue scaling and becoming more powerful is by using qubits that we take from nature. So there's there's no manufacturing behind the chip. Uh, what we use are individual atoms that we literally just snatch in, 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 in a vacuum and hold on to with laser beams. And this allows us to control many of these qubits all at once. Uh, and that allows us to continue building larger and larger systems. And to give you a sense of this, I was talking about starting with, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a research lab, starting with an empty space in 2015, that quickly moved to 51 by 2017. Now we have systems working with 256 of these qubits 
and we see this uh, continuing to expand. So we take these these you know identical qubits to one another, neutral atoms. We isolate them inside a vacuum chamber, and using all optical control lasers, we are able to create very large and, and very clean processors that we can reprogram every time that a user is running a circuit. Okay. And um, just for like real high level for people who are familiar with, let's say, trapped ion, how does this greatly differ? Uh, many of the technologies are similar, but the difference is precisely in, in that neutral versus, versus ion. Right? Yeah. We are using atoms that are, in a sense, complete, <laughs> how you would mm -hmm. find them mostly in, in nature. And there's a big advantage to this in that the these neutral atoms they don't they don't necessarily interact with one another. When you have ions, because they are charged particles, it's kind of like the the classic experiment of rub a uh, uh, balloon in your hair and you see how it gets all frizzy. It's because things are constantly pushing against one another. With neutral atoms, you don't get that. So wherever you want the atoms to be, that's where they are, and they're not they're not you know, fighting against this. So having having this optical control and the ability to put them wherever we want allows us to have very large, very dense uh, systems of, of neutral atoms. Okay, yeah, that's a real great way to uh, keep it simple. Ionization obviously implies charge, so I wanted people to understand that difference. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now it all comes to life in a 256 qubit machine. So uh, tell us a little bit about that machine. Yeah, this this is our, our first machine. We're very happy uh, about having connected it to the cloud recently and made it available to customers. Aquila is the first and so far only neutral atom quantum computer available to users everywhere on the cloud. Uh, it is a a machine that that allows users to very effectively use the the quantum resources available to them by being able to program the the effectively the geometry of the chip. So if you've heard about, for example, um, there are these uh, FPGAs that are very efficient for, for you know, classical computation. We're doing something similar with uh, what we call an FPQA mode or field programmable qubit array. Uh, and this gives users the ability to directly decide where atoms are going to be placed relative to one another. And then in real time, we'll take these instructions and Aquila will position all of our qubits in the in the places that the that our customers are are asking for. The reason why this is important is because if you think about things like optimization of, of a graph problem, Right, this this has uh, implications for logistics, for finance. Uh, you want to be able to use the the few qubits that you have as effectively as possible, and by being able to move the qubits around and to map whatever problem, whatever graph you have in mind directly onto the geometry of those qubits, you can you can cut down a lot on the overhead. So this is this is the kind of the the, the first unique feature of of Aquila, and we've seen it uh, get a very warm and positive reception by by customers uh, that have started accessing it on the cloud and exploring problems in very different verticals, both in in uh, uh, with commercial partners all the way from automotive, finance, uh, logistics, uh, but also with academics that are accessing it to further their own research and get access to, to resources that up to now have been locked away in just a few labs around the world. So, I mean, you started kind of answering this, but I was going to ask you um, if there are any aspects of the machine that like make it better at certain types of use cases. So we started with um, optimization and how would this compare then to, let's say, an annealer uh, in terms of uh, yeah. performance? I mean, it's, it's, it's 
sometimes hard to make comparisons with other platforms, mm -hmm. uh, especially because there aren't a lot of other available machines that, that we can use to benchmark out there at this scale. Uh, one, what I can tell you is, uh, for example, for optimization, we work together with our, our partners in the research world at, uh, Harvard, MIT, and other places to look at how can we use these, these machines to develop heuristic quantum algorithms that solve optimization problems and particularly very hard optimization problems. And what we found was that the, the scaling as we make the problems bigger and bigger and harder and harder, the scaling for the quantum device is better than the, the, the classical algorithm that we're, we were using, which is actually what's behind annealing. This algorithm is even known as simulated annealing. It's using a, a digital classical computer to try to emulate how, how these processes happen in nature. So that's, that's a very important point of comparison for us. <clears throat> but there are other areas that we have been looking uh, where beyond optimization, uh, there's two classes of problems that I think are, are interesting to discuss. One is, of course, in the, uh, there's a, a lot of interest nowadays in, in machine learning. And mm -hmm. we found uh, a few particular ways of doing machine learning that we can do on, on this type of machine very directly. And we're looking at, uh, at developing you know, heuristic, again, ways of, 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 of training these models and comparing them to classical alternatives. So this is, for example, something we're making a direct comparison with other quantum devices is a little hard because we don't have devices to, to compare with, or at least not that are easily accessible on the cloud. Um, uh, there's, there's been a lot of interest in seeing how these machi quantum machine learning applications uh, can give us some advantage, especially in classification, classification problems. Um, and beyond that, we know that there are problems where before, before quantum computers were really a thing, there was this idea that uh, some of the problems that, we, that we're trying to solve are predicting the behavior of, of natural systems, you know, materials, chemicals, and so on. And there was this idea of, of quantum simulation saying, well, in reality, what we would like to do is to efficiently simulate nature, but we know that nature is, is quantum mechanical. So we need to build computers or, or systems that are quantum mechanical in nature. And this was a key idea by a famous American physicist, Richard Feynman. Of and course. we see Back that for these yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And we see that for these kinds of applications, um, which is where where a lot of our um, of our users and the research community are 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 accessing the, the device, there we see that what we can do with with these very large systems with uh, hundreds of qubits, is very unique and it's already adding insights uh, to, to how we think about these problems and how we think about designing new materials, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I know uh, with this system, you introduce a concept people don't often hear, um, this idea of like analog mode and then digital mode. So I definitely want to spend a few minutes going into that because it, it's just not something anyone's coming across, right? <laughs> so the idea is it's in analog yeah. mode now, it's going to be in digital mode. So definitely some clarifications need to hear for, for everyone. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a, it's a great question. I think it, in some ways we're we're kind of following also in the footsteps of, of classical computing <laughs> and it seems to be a cyclical thing. Uh, digital, digital computers are what we know about today, but, uh, you know, back in the day, there was also the, the concept of, of doing analog computing and even in electronics today, there are some things that can be done better with, with analog systems. Uh, when you look around, there's, there's now actually a renewed interest, for example, for machine learning and AI applications to use, uh, analog systems because they can have some built-in tolerance to, to 
errors and perturbations. Um, and what we're, what we're doing with, with this system, with Aquila, uh, as of right now, it, the way to program it is not by breaking down an algorithm into very small components, like single to qubit gates, but by encoding the way that all of the qubits are interacting with one another and then changing that over time. So what the way that users are, are programming Aquila is, you know, it's, it's two phases. The first one is defining the problem and how are the qubits connected to one another, as I was explaining earlier. And the second part is how do we make the qubits basically talk to one another to, to, to solve the problem or, or, or even to do this in a in a kind of chaotic uh, way, for example, when we're looking at some of this uh, machine learning. And uh, to do this, we use a real-time signal, an, an analog signal that controls the whole system. Now, this is, this is helpful for, uh, for certain problems today because it makes the performance be better. So if you, if you have, as we do today, only a finite number of qubits and a finite amount of time over which the uh, quantum program can run, you want to use it as effectively as possible. And what we found is that for many of these problems in optimization and machine learning, you're better off encoding the problem directly in the connectivity of the qubits and then using this analog mode to effectively control the, the way in which imperfections can, can affect the outcome of your solutions. Now, this is only the beginning. And as you said, uh, we're, we're also looking into digital. Digital is where, where the kind of operation, uh, the kind of, of, of operation that you see for most quantum computers nowadays, where everything is broken down into single two qubit gates. And it's mm -hmm. a very powerful level of abstraction that you can add. Well, it turns out that with, with a neutral atom platform and with a system like Aqualab, you can use the same platform to run on, uh, to run both kinds, analog and digital. So we're working on enabling the tools for digital operation, and you can even mix and match and, and do a hybrid mode of operation. And I know that quantum computing, we've talked uh, where there's a lot of talk about hybrid, talking about hybrid classical and quantum. Here I'm talking mm -hmm. hybrid quantum quantum using tools both from the analog side and then more tools from the digital side. And what we see here is an ability, for example, to, to prepare resource states using the analog evolution and then use the digital operations to, to uh, extract much more out of them. So this is, again, going back to machine learning applications, for example, where we see expanding the use of it. Okay, so when I first heard about this, um, you know how when people pitch a movie, they say it's something meets something. It, it's it's a, a haunted house story in outer space, and you get alien. Like when I first heard it, I was like, oh, it's D Wave meets Ion Q. Like I, I didn't know how to like wrap my head around uh, what the whole process feels like. Um, but it sounds like in a moment when when we talk about um, how to code this, it'll it'll make a little more sense. Um, but before we leave like the pure hardware realm, uh, yeah. I just, do you have any thoughts about scalability? Is there anything about this type of architecture that will help you achieve high qubit counts? Uh, you know, like going back to the D-Wave example, uh, because it's an annealer, you know, it has like 6,000 qubits. It's just the number that seems to be skewed compared to like gate-based. Uh, so, so how does this kind of progress? What does it look like going down the pike? Yeah, no, uh, uh, scalability is, is crucial, right? Like uh, the, really the, one of the big reasons that why we started this work is because of the inherent ability for, for this platform to continue scale. As I, as I was mentioning, we started, started with basically nothing a few years ago, and we were very, we were able to very quickly with a small team to take this to tens and now hundreds of qubits. And, uh, one of the, the great advantages of using neutral atoms is that because we can pack them very tightly, because we can very efficiently use our controls. I mean, we start with a single laser beam that then turns into you know, thousands of, of, of kind of split spots. Mm -hmm. 
we can we can take the you know devices like like the one we have right now on the cloud and with minor modifications go from 256 that we have right now to a thousand and ten thousand and we continue going up in numbers so that's that's the first part of the of the equation right it's can you put in more qubits together? And that's honestly a non-trivial ask for for uh, a lot of the platforms. If we had to use cryogenic systems, then we would have a much harder time doing this. The footprint would would get very large very quickly, and we would have to think about interconnects and so on. But we can avoid all of that because of of the the you know the the properties of neutral atoms. The second part for scaling is how do you control this, right? And uh, the the analog mode allows us to have few uh, few control lines effectively. But even in the digital operation mode, we are um, we're working on really cool tech that allows us to to implement uh, quantum logic gates in parallel across the system very efficiently and do this without needing to have a lot of cables going in because we do everything optically. So this is, again, another another area where where the hardware has uh, a big advantage. If we have to put in, you know, a cable for every qubit that we have to control, then this very quickly becomes, yeah, it gets out of control, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, but but by being able to to address things in groups and 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 implement gates in parallel using just lasers, it's a lot easier to control these systems at scale. So that's that's really where we're going, and I think that's going to be one of the things that is going to set our platform apart. So is it fair to say then that with with this control model of um, the parallel uh, systems? Is it kind of like interconnect is built in because you'll be able to control so many? It's just built into your architecture in a sense yeah. instead of coming up with some new connection mode. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of new ways about thinking about the the OS and the programming to move the quantum information much more efficiently within the the processor without having to incur in very costly, for example, swap gates that are necessary in a lot of the fixed architectures. Uh, mm -hmm. You can think about having different zones for for this kind of processor and having in some ways kind of like intra-connects. And by the time that you need to think about interconnects between different mm -hmm. between different devices, then you could be already at the, you know, Hundred thousand million uh, physical qubit scale. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> At that point, why even bother, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's pretty impressive. And and any thoughts on like error correction and what that would look like in the future? Um, it yeah. might be early, but uh, no, I, it's never too early to think about error yeah. <laughs> correction. I mean, that's um, we take this very seriously. And we're looking at how do we enable error correction in a way that is using the hardware to its best uh, ability. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of cool ideas that we're, that we're developing for using the ability to, uh, reprogram effectively the, the system and the geometry in real time to implement error correction in a more efficient way. And I'd like to also call out some very very cool results that came out uh as a preprint so not yet actually published from uh from work done primarily at harvard but even with uh some people from quora on demonstrating very high performance in entangling gates uh you know getting past some of the thresholds that are necessary to take error correction very seriously so we expect that there's more to come uh, in the next, you know, few years where you're going to see quantum error correction become a reality and not just as a, as a one-time demonstration, but as a, uh, with an approach that can scale to these very large numbers of physical qubits. Great. And for now, the way to interact with this machine, uh, there, there's a couple, so I'd like to talk about them. Um, First yep. off, there's, I guess, am I saying it right? Blockade, but with a Q. So B-L-O-Q-A-D-E. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, Blockit is is um, a wonderful uh, open source package that we created. It allows users to understand how to how to program Aquila and to then use it to actually program Aquila directly. Uh, it is a numerical emulator of quantum systems uh, like uh, our processor. Uh, and it's a great way for, for users to start getting acquainted with how to write algorithms, to test their algorithms with a, with the kinds of sizes that are still, that a classical computer can still handle, um, and then transfer those, uh, those developments directly to the hardware and test it on, on the hardware directly. So you're able to select, um, Aquila as a backend target. Uh, to yeah, it's it's one of the programming modes. Yeah, mm -hmm. to send it out. Okay, and um, how does this compare? Just so people can visualize uh, until they go play with it themselves. How would this compare to like let's say interfaces they've seen in the past? Um, either, um, for example, like Composer for IBM or something. How does it look different? Uh, I mean, it, the interface feels very you know. In many ways, very similar to what you would use with uh, with other providers. It's we're trying to make it as user friendly as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. Describe your program and easy to write and interpret code. Uh, the thing that's different is that the the way of programming itself, right? Like the way that you send instructions, as we were talking about earlier, is a little bit different uh, because. What you're going to be doing with with blockade is to first of all define what is the what is the the geometry of the processor that you want. So that's going to be the the first set of instructions that you want. So this is a set of coordinates for where eventually the atoms are going to be in some you know in some some plane floating inside a vacuum chamber. And the second part is how are the the few key uh, control knobs going to to change over time, and that is how you are programming your algorithm. So it's really just these these two very simple, conceptually simple uh, uh, pieces of code that you need to put together, and then you can see the outcomes and you can build your own analysis pipelines. And, uh, also, start integrating this into some hybrid now quantum classical uh, optimizer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and will the software be changing then for digital mode? Will there be um, like new features gonna, being added? Yeah, yeah. We're going to be expanding uh, the, the, the the tools that we have available uh, through Blockade to incorporate new ways of programming. And as we add more and more controls, and we enable them to users, we're going to have blockade track the development of the hardware and, and in some ways even lead the development of the hardware so that users can, you know, can get ready to take the best advantage of the tools that we're going to be providing. Okay. And are there other ways to submit tasks to Aquila? I mean, I know it's available yeah, yeah. on Bracket, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, uh, this is a partnership that we're, we're incredibly happy with. Uh, we connected Aquila to Amazon Bracket in November of last year, and uh, since then we've seen uh, very heavy usage. Uh, we're we're <laughs> seeing we're seeing lots of customers come through and really engage with the with, with the device. So there's there's the the Bracket API that users can, can access and that they can use to can write their own algorithms and, and submit their their jobs and it's it's actually been great to see how quickly people have adopted it and how far ranging uh, uh, the the set of users that we've seen come through has been uh, as I was saying and this goes from everywhere from from the automotive industry the finance industry uh, logistics, uh, we're seeing academic customers uh, engage with it. And one of the great things is seeing how all of these different sets of users are, are using the device and when they reach out to us and, and we set up partnerships or, or we support their, their developments, 
it also helps us see where where in the near term can we add the most value with the hardware and how should we you know redirect our our tech development efforts to support more and more customers yeah and you bring up a good point about like near term value there um i guess before we close i just want to get a sense of uh, you know this year maybe the the economy is a little wonky right <laughs> um trying to figure out some customers are trying to figure out how they can get the best bang for their buck when, when experimenting with quantum and then some of them choose quantum inspired instead um what do you, what do you see as um a way to return real value, like get some ROI on experimentation. Are there particular use cases you think will will show promise sooner than later on your particular hardware? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I think that that our users, uh, for the most part, understand that that quantum is an incredibly promising technology, that it's really a question of when it gets there, not if, mm -hmm. and that um, what, what we're forming are long-term partnerships that allow us to shape the, the capabilities to enable users, uh, you know, users' applications much more. <clears throat> uh, I think that there is an understanding that more is yet to come and that the quantum computing space is evolving very rapidly and that cap capabilities are advancing very rapidly. Uh, but in the near term, what we what we're seeing is users that are very excited about testing, for example, machine learning, where because of the larger expressivity of of the uh, of the quantum quantum systems and quantum processors, uh, we expect to see some interesting results with quantum machine learning. At the same time, I think it's important to recognize that you know the the best code is is written by by trial and error and mm -hmm. what what users are are asking us for is a different way to approach quantum that is very hands-on that is um that is getting access to large processors so that they can write their own algorithms they can test them they can see what works what doesn't and in in the areas that I was mentioning, in machine learning and optimization and in simulation of other systems, this current technology, this this uh, analog uh, operation, and in, in the future, the expanded capabilities for for a hybrid analog digital are exactly what we're hearing from our customers that they want, and they wanted to see not just what is the performance now, but by being able to access system with hundreds of qubits, they can see the progression of how well does my algorithm work in small problems, 10 qubits or so, how does it work with 50, how does it work with 100, with 200, and that allows them also to extrapolate and work with us to, to tweak things so that we can bring the best possible capabilities to them as quickly as possible. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Extrapolation is a lot easier when you have a lot of points to map yeah, out exactly. <laughs> and draw that line through. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, I like the way you put it. It definitely is a matter of when, not if. So yeah, um, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more from this machine. And, and I hope listeners will uh, visit uh, Bracket and, and also play with Blockade and see uh, if they can write their own algorithms on here too. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for, for joining. I, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you, Constantinos. This was great.